Do you know that 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 phrase, the three persons of the Trinity? Any idea where that came from? Three persons of the Trinity. Well, in Latin, person is persona. And it came from the Greek and Roman plays in which one individual would play more than one part. And so they had a number of different masks. And they would put on different masks when it was time to play a different part. And Christians quickly saw that and began realizing, hey, maybe that's what God is doing. He comes to us as Father. He just came to us as Son, and He left us Holy Spirit, same God. But He showed Himself. He revealed Himself in three ways. And as for the idea of how can there be three in one, let me just say this. I am more than just a trinity myself. I really am. Because I'm a husband to the lady in the back there. I'm a husband. But that's not all I am. I'm a father to two young men who are here this morning. We're getting in the car this afternoon, going to Alabama, and I'm going to be a brother to my brother and my sister. And I'm going to be a son to my mother and father, a son. All those different things, I am all those different things, and yet I'm still just me. I'm even going to be a scared little kid because my mama doesn't know that I've got this beard. <laughs> and she hates facial hair. It's going to be almost as bad as a tattoo. Only, only I can shave it off. See, but, but even as a scared, scared kid, still me, still me. God, you might say God has many, many hats. He comes to us in different forms at different times, depending on what the need is. And so while the New Testament gives us three of those, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The Old Testament has a whole lot more. And it was always when God was given a name, a new name, it was always that it demonstrated or described how God was relating to his people based on the circumstance. For example, in the beginning, he's the creator. Genesis 1-2. In the beginning, God. And the Spirit of God. That's the very first place the Holy Spirit shows up, by the way. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters of the deep. And in the mind of the Hebrews, the depth, the, the deep was associated with chaos, with fear, with things they didn't understand. And God, the Spirit of God, hovering over that, preparing to draw a world out of it showed up as a creator, and then he showed himself as a judge with the flood, Noah, ark, destruction. He showed himself as a judge. Then in Exodus, God was the rescuer. They, they used the word redeemer, which, which you can use also rescuer, pretty much the same thing, and that, that's a more common word for us. But that's who he was. He was their rescuer. Then when they got into Canaan, that's where you hear God described as a warrior that goes out before Joshua and the armies of Israel. He's a warrior who fights for his people. And next come the prophets. And in the prophets, God was a disciplinarian, pointing out the wrongs of his children, showing what was wrong, teaching them what was right. In the Psalms, he's most often a shepherd. Thank David for that. And then, of course, when Jesus came, we learn he's also our father. He's your father. All these different 
mask of God. And yet I'm not comfortable with that term because mask has a negative association with many of us. It makes the point, but this message is called the hats of God. The many hats of God. In the New Testament, the Bible tells us that God was in Christ. Reconciling the world to himself. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19. That You might say it this way. In a stable, in Bethlehem, one starry night, God put on his Jesus hat. Because that's when the word was made flesh and it dwelt among us. And John said, we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was the most amazing, full picture, demonstration, tangible demonstration of, of who God is. And you know what? You ever worry what God is like? You ever wonder what God is like? Well, God is a mighty complex concept. But if God is like Jesus, we're in pretty good shape. If God is like Jesus, then this is a good world. God's like Jesus. There's mercy and there's hope. Even in the darkest situation. Even in death. God's like Jesus, then there's life on the other side. And I believe he's like Jesus. There's a definition of definition of spirit. Because in Jesus, you got the spirit of God dwelling in this human form. John 4, 24. Let's throw that one up on the screen. Jesus making this as clear to the people of his time as, as they could possibly understand. This was a stretch for them because they thought of God, unfortunately, the average person probably thought of God as dwelling only in the temple. And sure enough, he was in the temple, but he was other places too. God's, Jesus said God is spirit. For those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. You know what, by the way? When it says God is spirit, that's one of the few places in the scripture where the name for God is not a metaphor. For example, when when it says God is my shepherd, it doesn't. I mean... Anybody over fifth grade knows that does not literally mean that God has a staff that he walks around with and with a hook on the end of it. When it says God is our rock and our fortress, you don't have to start asking, is it okay, is he granite or is it marble? What kind of rock? Don't miss it. Those are metaphors. But when it says God is spirit, that's not a metaphor. That's telling what he is and Jesus self, himself. Tells us that God is spirit. There's one other verse like that in 1 John where we're told what he is. Not what what he's like, but what he is. 1 John, over and over, God is love. So when you encounter the spirit, and when you encounter love, you have encountered God, whether you knew it or not. And... Most of the time, we don't know it. And do you know, I've come to realize that probably the main purpose of religion is helping people, I started to say connect with God, and that's, that's one way of saying it, but to get even more specific, religion is originally intended to teach people 
and make them aware of the God who's already there to teach us what that God is like, who he is, and a little bit at least about how his mind works, what's important to him, what's not important to him. Religion is supposed to teach us that, but religion gets, gets off focus. We get interested in a whole lot of other stuff. And so we've gotten to the point in society where you'll see more and more people who will say, I'm turned off to organized religion. And I can see why. And so they'll say, spiritual, spiritual, but not religious. Well, you know, that's okay to say that because those are really just words. But really, to say I'm spiritual or I'm into spirituality, that is saying the same thing that people meant when they said religion at one time back there. It's just that our understanding of religion has gotten associated with a lot of organization and certain rituals and rules and... Um, Things that can actually, in some cases, make it more difficult to sense, to see, to feel, and to recognize the Spirit of God that's always around us working. Henry Blackaby, in his book, Experiencing God, many of you have read that. He went through that study, and it's, one of his main points is God is always working. You don't have to ask him to go to work. He's always working, and he's working all around us. And so what's our job? Not to come up with something for God to do. That, by the way, isn't that most of our prayers? God, here's what we don't say it this bluntly, but basically here are the things I want you to do, God, today. This is your, this is your list. Prayer is about discerning what's on God's list. And you often find that by looking at what he's doing around you. And then you join him in it. That's what religion is supposed to be. It is supposed to be a process of awakening. New birth means you come with fresh new eyes. You're like Jacob who was a young man who didn't give a hoot about God until one night slept on a stone pillow, dreamed of a ladder that went to heaven, angels of God descending and ascending, which near as I can tell had something to do with God and his way of communicating with us. The message being God is going to communicate with the world through your descendants, Jacob. But Jacob awoke and he sensed something he'd never knew before. He said, the Spirit of God was in this place and I knew it not. What happened? Nothing changed except his perception. Spirituality, religion, is about Showing us, teaching us what to look for. And you know, there's also a sense in which, on a very deep level, we're already acquainted with God. Even a person who's not yet a Christian. You know why? Because whether you're yet a Christian or not, you were made in the image of God. What that means is, God, the Father, Put something of himself in you. And that doesn't mean you know, the image of God. I remember as a kid trying to figure out what that meant. And I thought, does that mean God looks like us? Well, obviously not if God is spirit. If God is spirit and his, we're created in his likeness, some translations say, then whatever that means, that image of God has something to do with a spiritual capacity that is within us. We're born with it. We're created with it. Now, that spiritual potential, capacity is there. Just like some people are born with a certain talent. But 
if they don't develop that talent or if they don't discover the talent, they never knew they had it, it's completely wasted. So, in Christianity, we're all about helping people see what's there, how Jesus has come to teach you what you can be and give you a new birth, a new start, a whole new way of life. That's in us. And once again, good religion will teach us to tap into that. You see, all of us, whether we've yet been saved or not, we have layer upon layer upon layer of gunk that life in this world has stacked upon us. You've heard me talk about that concept before. You, the essential you, that's the you that God created. That's who you really are. And when you're saved, when you're born again, that's the part of you that is born again for eternity. But there's that part of you that God made. There's also this part of you the world made. When you got hurt and you reacted the best you could, but it was in the wrong way and it warped you, it soured you, you got sinned against, you sinned against others, and when that goes on year after year, the longer we live, the more layers of gunk are piled on top of who we really are. So that's why repentance is such a big deal upon becoming a Christian. To repent is to recognize this stuff in my life. And, and, and I'm not just talking about the most common thing you hear, um, which is sexual sin, drunkenness, whatever. And those, are, those things will certainly <laughs> interfere with your connection with God. But to just mention those kind of things is so misleading. Because it misses the reality that there are millions of Christian people who do not drink, smoke, or chew, or go with the girls who do. But they do not know. But they might as well, as far as whatever, what difference it's going to make in their relationship with God. Because they're... They're involved in other things, things like grudges, greed, hypocrisy, greed in the sense of the desire for more and more and more, hypocrisy, not merely in the sense of, well, I say I'm a Christian, but I still wind up sinning. I don't know that that's exactly what hypocrisy is, especially as long as you don't pretend to be sinless. The kind of hypocrisy that, that is really destructive is the kind Jesus was pointing out in the Pharisees. And they were not adulterers and they were not street bums. They were very, they were men with high morals, but he said they were hypocrites. And the big hypocrisy in them is that they had religion. They had this form and they were going around giving that to people as if it was what people needed, as if that was somehow going to help people connect with God, bring them alive spiritually, give them a new start, and all it was was a bunch of burdens that they piled upon people. Jesus basically said, that kind of hypocrisy is such a misrepresentation of what I came to give because I came to give life. And life more abundant. All those things though. Will. Pile up layer upon layer. On that image of God in us. And it can happen. It does happen. Even to Christians. And so you as a Christian. You. you, you I'm, I may be using language. 
wording that you haven't heard before, but you've heard this your whole life. It's Romans 7 through chapters 7 through 9. It's that in me, that is in my flesh. He's talking about this part of me that the world made. There is no good thing. And yet, there's this other part of me that wants to do what's right, but I can't seem to pull it off because there's a war in me. And unfortunately, this other dark side often wins. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? And the answer is Jesus Christ. He's the one who delivers us from that. How does he go about it? What does that actually look like in day-to-day practice for a Christian? I'm going to tell you. When you sign on to follow Jesus Christ, you are signing up for an experience, a life journey that will transform you in the process. The only way you're going to be able to follow him and keep following him honestly, authentically through this world is to allow him to expose to you those dark things. Not because they make him hate you. No, no, no. But because those are the things that choke out the spirit and smother you spiritually. And so... Christian life, one of my favorite phrases, it's not so much about addition as it is subtraction. You see, as a Christian, you have received Christ. What more could you possibly need? God has done the addition already. And now we work with him on the subtraction. And as layer on layer is pulled away, that born again spirit in us is more and more the part that's leading us. You know, you ever, women, wives, you ever, you ever, you ever come home to one, one husband on Tuesday night and then a completely different husband on Wednesday night? You know what I'm talking about? Same person, different personality. The godly one, the one that is love and peace and joy, when that's what, when that's what is coming out of us, it's because The Spirit of God is moving through us unhindered. We're not resisting it. And what's in us comes out. But you heard me say this from the beginning of CCF. Whatever's in you is what's going to come out. And so if you want to rid rid your conversations of filthy talk or destructive, slanderous, gossipy talk, whatever. Um, It's not so much about just biting your lip when you start to say something. Although that's part of it. The main thing you've got to do is cooperate with God as he cleans out all that junk. And so what comes out will be Christ. You got this potential. And I see this potential in everybody here, even those of you whom I don't know. I know it's there. God made you. I don't know how well you're cooperating with Him in the work He wants to do. But I know it's there. And if 
the world, the life you've created through the way you've operated the last decades is more like hell than it is like heaven, then that's a pretty good indication that that's the direction you're going. Hell. Hell is something that starts in this life. And carries on over. The good thing about. <laughs> there's only one good thing. About going through hell in this life. In this life. <laughs> maybe in this life. There is a purgatory. In this life. While you're still alive. And you are going through hell. You. Can surrender to God. And allow him. To purge. You. Allow him to do his work in you. And you will come out a different person on the other side. I know this from personal experience on many occasions.